from Taiwan to Latin America to Europe, the whole world is watching the results of today's election as the next president will oversee everything from funding Ukraine's defense against Russia to trade deals with China and Mexico. Joining me to game out the potential impacts is Michael O'Hanlon, Director of Research for Foreign Policy at Brookings Institution. Michael, it's great to see you. What's top of mind? Wow. Well, I think what's top of mind is probably China because I think I see the greatest disparity in the candidates' views in regard to that important country, hugely important country. A lot of people think they're relatively similar. Yeah, I don't know. I think that the Biden-Harris administration got off to a bad start with China, which is not uncommon. Often, even George H.W. Bush after Tiananmen Square had a bad start, or Bill Clinton with the EP3 episode. But the Harris-Biden team, I think, has largely stabilized that relationship. It's not at a very good level, but it's stable at the moment. There seems to be an ongoing dialogue between Xi Jinping and Joe Biden, uh, and therefore, presumably, Kamala Harris. There seems to be now some military to military communications. There still are a lot of tensions, for example, in the South China Sea, and a lot of disagreements over tech, po tech policy and trade. But it's stable. Nobody's proposing big, new, huge disruptions at the moment. And there's sort of a business-like civility in the relationship. I think all of that would be at doubt under a President Trump. I'm more intrigued by Trump's views towards Russia, where even though I don't think he has a serious peace plan in mind for the Ukraine war, I think his instincts aren't so bad and may bring some useful disruption to the process. But in regard to China, he makes me very nervous. So, how you know, during his first administration, there were those who said the um, the, the threat of, of the changes he was proposing, the tariffs and all the rest of it, were actually emboldening the reformers within China. Um, do you think that that was true? And would that be true again this time around, or is the landscape very different? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't think that Donald Trump had a bad legacy on China after his first term, to be fair. And I'm a critic of his approach to decision making overall because of his sort of impulsive way. It scares me to see somebody with a uh, finger on the nuclear button make decisions that way. But in fairness, looking back on the 2017 to 2021 period, in many ways, he not only put up some good barriers to Chinese tech theft and, and the like, but he created policies that President Biden and Vice President Harris have largely followed. So it's not so much the legacy and whatever effect he might have had, for example, on the reformers then, as you mentioned. It's more about these big new ideas for dramatically big disruptions, especially on the economic side. But I think that would spill over into the entire relationship and probably increase the risks of security crises as well. Would it potentially be the other way around? I know we're dwelling a lot on China, but I, it's interesting you kind of went there first, would it potentially open up the Chinese towards seizing a moment with Taiwan under a Harris Walls administration? In other words, could the disruption come from their end, not ours? Well, first of all, all bets are off, no matter who's president, in the sense that China, of course, has the ability to decide to go and try to take Taiwan at any given moment. And there are a lot of people that believe Xi Jinping sees that as a preeminent priority for his remaining years in, in power. Uh, but I think with the Harris team, You've got a team that's sort of used to dealing with this issue, uh, and there presumably would be some holdover from a for, from a Biden term, and also some of Harris's people have dealt with this issue before. And basically, we know how to respond in kind to Chinese provocations using a combination of military and economic assets. Hmm. With Trump, he may scare the Chinese into being intimidated and not acting at all. That's possible. But it's also possible that they would see his views as malleable or just unpredictable and not even cohesive or coherent because he changes his mind from moment to moment. For example, if he leads to the impression the United States would not help defend Taiwan, as he said this summer, and China reads that too literally, right. then we could see an increase in the risk of war. Let me ask sort of the last question, go back to the Middle East then, and ask how, you know, presidential election notwithstanding, you see that situation uh, coming to a close, if you do. Well, I think it's all in Israel's hands in terms of the next step, as we've seen today with the firing of the defense minister, because he favored some kind of a long-term political vision for Gaza, and Prime Minister Netanyahu did not, because he favored a ceasefire, and Netanyahu did not. Uh, you know, I don't know that the White House and its inhabitant is the main concern on Netanyahu's mind. There was a very insightful article recently by Michael Duran at Hudson, where he basically outlined what he thinks is the Israeli strategy, and that's to chop Hamas up into pieces and maybe make localized ceasefire deals with individual commanders, but not even think about a broad ceasefire. That feels to me like what Netanyahu is up to, and I don't think that depends on whether it's Trump or Harris. Is there a final place you would direct our attention as we think about kind of hot spots or places 
is where relationships could actually improve. Well, I only mentioned Russia and Ukraine in passing. And on both uh, the candidates' fronts, I think they have some serious thinking to do. We're going to need a new strategy towards that war for a new president, because Biden's approach has been pretty good, but it was really about making sure Ukraine was not overrun. It was not really a war termination strategy. It was a survival strategy. It worked as far as it went, but are we going to just keep this war going for three and four and five and six years, right. or are we going to get more assertive about some kind of a strategy? Richard Haas recently wrote a very good piece in Foreign Affairs about how we might have to lower our standards for success a little bit and try to persuade the Ukrainians to think that way as well hmm. in order to try to end this war. That's a big, big decision for our next.